Welcome everyone, I'm Dick Deming. I'm medical director of Mercy One Cancer Center and I'm the founder of Above and Beyond Cancer. Welcome to our weekly cancer education series. This series is brought to you in part by a grant from the Rosalie and Sherry Exline Ziegler Fund. And today we're gonna be talking about um, how to change our lives. And my guest uh, this evening is Laura Mead. Welcome, Laura. Hi, thank you. So Laura grew up in Johnston and then uh, got her bachelor's degree at the University of Iowa. Mm -hmm. Go Hawkeyes. And she currently is a mental health counselor at Mind and Spirit Counseling. Yes. So welcome. You know, originally we were going to do this in January and we called it something like uh, resolution, setting resolutions. But, you know, you don't have to only uh, focus on change and resolutions in January. So it's okay for us to talk about it in February. Yeah. 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 So welcome. So tell us about yourself. What what was your claim to fame in high school? Oh my gosh. What was my claim to fame in high school? Uh choir. I was okay. in show all choir? the choirs. Yes, show choir. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. My my daughter is in seventh grade. Um, I have three kids, but my oldest is in seventh grade and she's in the walkie seventh grade show choir. Oh, and okay. it has been just like the thrill of a lifetime watching her be in uh -huh. show choir. So yeah. So do you remember back to your senior year? What 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 numbers you did in your in your routine for show choir, senior year of high school. Um, did you get have? Do you get any solos? No. Oh, okay. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. And then, what was your claim to fame as a Hawkeye? Oh gosh, um, just being a Hawkeye, okay. just cheering on the football <laughs> team, cheering on the basketball team, just being a Hawkeye, so just you went enjoying to most of the, the games. experience. Yeah. yeah. Little uh, Hawkeye tattoos on oh, your yeah. cheek. Okay, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how did you happen to choose uh, mental health as a career? Yeah. So um, so I came about it sort of non-traditionally, I guess you would say. I started my career in the business world. I was a project manager. Um, and then I took a pause to take care of my family as it started to grow. And after I had my first daughter, I had my own experience with postpartum anxiety. And I saw um, just a group of really tough moms around me having the same experiences. And I thought, gosh, I wish there were more people around helping women through this. And then I started to think, why can't I do that? And so I enrolled at Drake and started off on a path and I fell in love with postpartum counseling. I fell in love with grief and loss counseling. I fell in love with trauma counseling and here I am today. Yeah. And what do you think fundamentally draws you to counseling? Is it helping other people? Is that the, the sense of fulfillment that you get from helping others? Or well, Yeah. Um, so this is what I think about that, is that we were never supposed to be these individuals struggling by ourselves. Struggle is inherent in life. Mm -hmm. And I found that out as an adult. <laughs> And um, we weren't supposed to ever have to do that alone. We were supposed to be pack animals and live in these villages and have these communities around us. And that's why we have churches and we have families and we have friend groups and neighbors and people who help us get through these things. And we live in a society that tells us that we're supposed to be individuals and stand on our own two feet and do things alone and struggle alone. And I think that's not mm. right. Mm. And so when I decided that I wanted to be a counselor, I wanted to be a helping hand. I wanted to be a person that said, you don't have to struggle alone. I will struggle with you. I will do it with you. Wonderful. So. Yeah. You know, just ironically, I was watching last night a documentary EO uh, Wilson who studied ants and then subsequently switched to this whole created social biology. Mm -hmm. as a as an entity and how do communities of organisms whether they're ants or human beings yeah. get along as a as a community and you're right that uh, our mental we're probably at the best m from a mental health perspective with community yeah and even the term mental health is is weird when we talk about if i just said physical health someone thinks of you know, a, a fit person. When you say mental health, 
someone thinks of the opposite, that we use the phrase mental health, or at least it's more associated with, with mental health issues as opposed to good mm, mental health. Yeah. I mean, that's just an observation I've made. Mm -hmm. Like you're not you aware say? of your mental health until you're not mentally yeah. healthy. Is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we don't usually talk about, you know, exceptional mental health. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't look at somebody and go, they're awfully mentally healthy. Huh. <laughs> yeah. It, yes. <laughs> and, and the role of mental health. So for today, we're not really talking about, um, um, mental health issues mm -hmm. it's how does how can we use counseling and mental health in a positive way to affect positive change i think that's really yeah. what a new year's resolution is about yeah how, how else would you um sort of uh, just talk about the concept of new year's resolutions well i think it's the joining of that right so a resolution like we said, a resolve to change is both mental and physical, right? And it might be spiritual. It's holistic, mm -hmm. right? It's the whole. And so we have to engage all of those pieces. And so that's how they all tie together is that we have to engage the mental health piece if we're going to engage the other pieces. Mm -hmm. We have to make it work. And even as we say that, we know that it's a bit artificial to divide mind, body, spirit. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not like we have a separate compartment for each of those aspects and, and all of it makes up ourselves. Um, and uh, I would love you to have you just reflect on the role of mental health counselors as a whole, as opposed to, oh, I've got depression or anxiety, so I'm going to see somebody to help fix that. How, mm -hmm. how would you more holistically talk about the role of a mental health counselor? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so <laughs> we can't fix that. Let's just start with that. Like we're not um, magic. Um, and don't we wish that we could, because I'll tell you what, if I could wave a wand and make that go away, I would. Um, but I'm here to be with you through that. I'm here to help you discover what's contributing to that. I'm here to help you discover what helps, you know, um, uh, to know what's a symptom of it and how do we tackle that symptom? How do we cope with that symptom? How do we set goals? How do we motivate? How do we affect change, mm -hmm. right? How do we get out of that place, get through that slump, <clears throat> take the next step, right? Because ultimately, we can hold still or we can keep moving. And I think what people want is to keep moving. So if somebody feels dissatisfied mm -hmm. um, uh, in some way, shape, or form, continuing to do everything the same mm -hmm. is not likely to get you out of that sense of dissatisfaction. Right. And what's worse is I think that it starts to feed a feeling of stuckness. Mm -hmm. You start to feel stuck. And then you feel agitated that you feel stuck, right? Mm -hmm. And so not only do we feel like we're holding still, but now we're frustrated that that's happening. So it's worse. And would you say that, um, so for example, I, I talk about a fear being a good thing. And, you know, when we sense fear because there's a car running at us or a dog chasing us on the bike or you know it it actually is pay attention there's some potential danger here and that fear can be a source of creativity and a source of ingenuity and, and would you say that in some ways maybe this sense of, of anxiety that we call and i know there's other names for it i'm not talking about you know clinical panic attack but that this this little something can be a, a wake-up call that they're telling us that something is not totally in alignment with what we want to be or what we want to do yes yeah, so this is something i talk to my patients about often is like 
there's never a time that we're supposed to have no anxiety, right? The anxiety is functional. There yes. is there is a time when anxiety is a good thing. If you're a little anxious that you got a test <laughs> coming up, yes. that's a good thing. And right. maybe that's reminding you to study. That's right. <laughs> yes. We're supposed to have some level of anxiety. If we did not have some level of anxiety, that would not be a healthy thing, right? It's when we get to those clinical levels of anxiety, when it's interfering, the the point at which we want to intervene is when it is interfering with our daily living, our work and school, our relationships. Those are the places where we have those warning signs that say, hey, we need help with this because that's not where we want to be. The zone we want to be at is the helpful anxiety, the anxiety that propels us, motivates us, helps us mm -hmm. along the way. Motivates us, can be a source mm -hmm. of ingenuity, creativity, doing something. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so um, sometimes when there's a major event in one's life, like a cancer diagnosis, or maybe a divorce or a bankruptcy or, you know, something, um, that often can serve as a, as a wake-up call to folks. I mean... You might be sort of on this treadmill of just doing today what I did yesterday and I'm going to do tomorrow. And um, sometimes a major event causes you to stop and reflect and really think about, is this what I want? Mm -hmm. What can I do to um, create the life that I would like to look back on and say, yes, that was a good life? Mm -hmm. Are there... Um, what's your been your experience when people experience that time in their life where they know they want to make some changes? You you, you reflected on your own postpartum yeah. anxiety, yeah. Mm -hmm. and that that clearly motivated you to make some changes. Yes, and I think I had to get out of it first, right? When it's not <laughs> when it's not uh, survival mode staring you in the face, the only thing you can look at, right? Yes, in the midst of um, your anxiety, you weren't <laughs> ready to apply to graduate sure. school. No, nope. Um, but once you're out of it, right, then that's the time to make some meaning out of it, right? Mm -hmm. To go, okay, so I made my way through the woods. What, what now? How do I make this meaningful? This thing that happened, it, it, you know, hit the stop button on my life, right? What do I do now with this, mm -hmm. right? And one of the best things that we can do with it for ourselves, for other people, is to make meaning out of it. Make meaning out of the difficulty. Mm -hmm. How do we reflect on that, make meaning out of it? Mm -hmm. And then do you have... How, how would you help someone who says, I, t I know that my life now is not what I want it to be, and I just don't feel fulfilled mm -hmm. or satisfied. How, what are ways of actively approaching the uh, 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 discernment before you just... Uh, buy a new convertible or move to California or do something uh, really abrupt, what's the best way to discern mm -hmm. what it is you're dissatisfied about and how you might want to change in a positive way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So often I ask my clients <laughs> to quietly envision the most beautiful version that their life could be and what does that look like for them mm -hmm. and I ask them to quietly sit and just envision that for a moment and take some time and think about where they are and what they're doing and who's around them and then I ask them to explain to me what they see and oftentimes that starts to point the arrow in mm -hmm. the right direction. Mm -hmm. So actively uh, giving them some uh, uh, tools to kind of think about it. Mm -hmm. um, so are there, <laughs> which makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. are there, um, like back in the day of MMPI tests, and are, are there oh, any, sure. um, 
you know, validated surveys that are helpful in someone trying to uh, discern where they might find more contentment professionally or in other more specific categories of one's life? I'm sure there are. I mean, there are career interest surveys. Um, it's not my area. Mm -hmm. I could point you in the right direction. Yeah. Well, I, but, your thought, are they, mm -hmm. are they particularly helpful, do you think? Or do you think the reflective uh, method that you're using is more real? I mean, I know sometimes mm -hmm. surveys can be, you know, there's the ones that tell you what your characteristics are and who you might work with better and mm -hmm. how to form a team. And I, you know, I, I, I know some of those are kind of gimmicky and I don't know how much, yeah. you know, are you an extrovert or an introvert and do you work in groups or singly? But, um, I think information is always helpful okay. in so much as what it means to you. Right. And in how you interpret it. Right. So you can go out and gather whatever information that you want to gather, but let's sit down and talk about it. What jumps out at you? What is it that you see from that information? What piques your interest? What surprised you? What didn't surprise you? What does it mean to you, right? That's what interests me out of that. How can we find the gold there, right? Information is always mine, you know, mineable for information, right? And that information can point us places that we can go, but it's information and it's what we do with that information, I think that matters. Okay. So uh, what I see um, in the, in, in many patients who have been uh, diagnosed with cancer sort of falls out of the sky as this mountain that you need to climb that you didn't ask for um, is the patients um, learn as much as they can about their diagnosis, mm -hmm. get a team, and then proceed with hope and optimism. And along the way, uh, they often uh, find the strength that's already within themselves. Mm -hmm. As they find the strength that's there, we might call that resilience. But then they say, you know what? I think I want to make some changes in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I've been given this second opportunity to live my life, and maybe I should do it in a more meaningful way um way and uh often start talking about changing their eating habits their exercise habits their finding mindfulness um how what are ways of helping to steer guide or coach someone in a positive way to to use this catalyst to actually make the changes mm -hmm. so i think a that's wonderful one or two things at a time, okay. right? Like, let's pace because right they're in the middle of something as they're doing this, right? Let's remember what's going on in their life. And so we want to keep in mind what's already on their plate, what stressors already exist while we add stressors, right? Because when we are trying something new, when we are trying to establish new, new habits, that's going to increase our stress load just a little, right? And so we want to be mindful of that. And so one or two things at a time, right, in about four-week chunks, right? And if we've repeated it over four weeks, about a month, then we can add another thing, right? Okay. So um, let's just get concrete. Mm -hmm. I want to eat healthy, uh -huh. <laughs> lose weight, and get more fit. Those right. are fairly common New Year's as sure. resolutions. Sure. Um, what are the? What would mental health tell us are ways of reasonably setting goals and accomplishing them? What mm -hmm. what what uh, habits? or what techniques uh, help lead to success. Right. And so I would encourage the person to think about instead of like what they're trying, instead of saying like, I want to stop snacking and um, 
avoid sitting on the couch and watching TV, right? Those are both like negative negative things, things right? Like avoiding so, things. Right. And I don't like walking away from, yeah. right? So I don't be like better that. to have I'd a like positive. To, yeah. I'd like to work on what you're walking towards, right? Okay. So I would like to add some nutrition into my diet. And I would like to add some time walking around or some meaningful movement into my day. Oh, okay. We can do that, right? And I want to keep it small, right? I don't want to change your whole life today, right? I want things that are manageable and I want things that you're naturally prone to. I don't want you to eat a food that you've never eaten or that you don't naturally like. I want you to add a healthy food that you might already kind of like. And I want you to do some intentional movement that you might be interested in or that you might like, right? We want to set you up for success, not for failure, mm -hmm. right? And I want you to be honest with me about your progress because you haven't failed if you haven't done the, set, the thing that you set out to do. You've given us information about how we can tweak your plan so that we can move forward, right? Okay. And so a, a coaching and, and having a coach and accountability mm -hmm. are those Big. two things that are, yeah. <clears throat> are more likely to uh, lead to success? I would almost say, too, having accountability and a buddy are two things that mm -hmm. really lead to success, right? Somebody who's there doing it with you, mm -hmm. you know, because there's that connection piece that comes with it, that piece that says, like, I got a friend. I get a social piece out of this. I get that little mm -hmm. uh, friendship piece out of it, too. There's some reward in there. Yeah, you know, I see that a lot in, in our group and just my own personal experience that, you know, I got a gang. We show up at 5 a.m. If I'm not there, there's, you know, not only do I miss the, the physical workout, the social workout, but there's that accountability piece, whereas it would be a lot easier to hit a few more snooze if, if I, my, my absence was not going to be noted. Yeah. Well, and I heard you guys talking before, you know, like you have inside jokes, you laugh with each other and like, that's part of the thing, right? You care about each other. That's healing in and of itself. That's part of what's good about it. That's a reward system. Um, what about folks who want to make just huge changes, like go from being a a um, project manager to a mental health counselor? Uh, I mean, that's a big change, which has to be scary. I, I guess maybe in your case, it was a bit of a transition in between, mm -hmm. but I've known people that, uh, you know, want to go from project manager to yoga instructor. And um, I, what are, uh, have you seen that dramatic changes in one's life? And what do you think is the healthiest way to assess is, is that change, number one, realistic, and number two, um, uh, likely to result in satisfaction? Because the grass isn't always greener. True. I would say there has to be a really compelling reason why, right? Why? Why go from this to that, right? What is the vision, right? What is the purpose? What is the reason why? If the reason why is because there's going to be some sort of external reward, I'm not sure that will work out all that great. If there's going to be a great internal reward, it might be worth it, right? There's some bravery in that. It just depends upon the person. And and I would say if there is a big change to come, there should be a solid support, support around the person mm -hmm. to help that change. But yes, I mean, my change came over 10 years. So <laughs> with a very big support system. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, and um, we we all face 
you know, forks in the road that we might not even realize when, you know, I look back at my career and how I ended up here. When I think of from high school forward, there were uh, probably decisions, not probably, there were decisions and turns I made without a lot of thought that ends up leading one down a pathway to, to where you are. Mm -hmm. And at what point, um, do, do you believe that it's a good thing to annually or monthly or weekly or daily take stock of where you are and, and uh, reflect on um, where, where you are, what you want to, where you want to be and how you might want to change? I think it's good to do that periodically. Yeah. I think it's good to take stock of where you are and what your goals are. And if that goal still holds, I think it's really a good thing to be mentally flexible about your goals, right? Mm -hmm. Just because you made a goal last year doesn't mean it has to be your goal next year, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Your life changes pretty rap rapidly and situations change and people come in and out of your life. And so it's okay if your goal changes. It's okay if your circumstances change and you can change your mind. You're allowed to. It's your life. You're the person who inhabits your body and wakes up in it every single day. And so, yes, reassessment is very necessary to figure out if that's still what you want, if you're still on that path. And then I think reassessment with your family and your loved ones is good to check in too, to make sure are we all on the mm -hmm. same page mm -hmm. are we all heading in the same direction so that we can make sure that as a unit we're all kind of going along the same way um so let's use the word um either happy or joy it's just this this sense of and i'm talking you know happiness in like the aristotle eudinomeia this this sense of a life well lived joy as opposed to hedonistic uh, beer on the beach for an hour sort of okay. joy. So, yeah. so um, what do you think uh, based on your experience, your personal experience and, 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 and being a counselor are some of the components that most likely lead to a joyous life in the big sense of joy? I think that living in the present moment and noticing when joy is happening at that moment is a huge component mm -hmm. to the joy that you are talking mm -hmm. about. I think if you watch children, they have an excellent sense of that joy. Mm -hmm and you can kind of soak it up from them <laughs> and um yeah i think you can learn a lot from that so yeah. just being there when it's present and noticing it can really have a cumulative effect over yeah. a lifetime because right now in this moment mm -hmm. we have everything we need mm -hmm. for total joy it's only when we start thinking about who dissed me yesterday and what might happen tomorrow that we lose the joy that comes from just being present. Yeah, I would agree with that. How do you help people be more in the here and now and the present more often mm -hmm. during the course of the day? Yeah. So I teach basic grounding and mindfulness as part of my practice, mm -hmm. which means that We've got to figure out if we are somewhere else, how to notice that we're somewhere else, right? So we, you know, I ask the classic question, where are you or where am I, right? And so where am I? Was I thinking about my grocery list? Was I thinking about tomorrow's activities? Okay, well, then I was in the future. Was I thinking about oh, that conversation that I had or... Uh, later on, going over this podcast in my mind and making sure I didn't make any huge mistakes uh, <laughs> than I was in the past, right? So, okay, where am I? Okay, so I recognize where I was. And then, okay, so 
how do I get back here? Well, if there's some options, right? So I can either use my five senses, right? And ground myself to the present moment by noticing the things that I can see and hear and touch and taste and smell, right? I can look at the colors in the room and identify them and breathe. I can imagine that I have to describe the room <laughs> in a book, right? And so I have to describe the textures and I have to describe the room exactly as it is, right? So I have to be present in the room to do that. And that kind of gets me back in the moment where I am, how I am, so that I can be here and be about my day, right? So that's your basic grounding ideas. Um, yeah. So I teach my clients how to do that and how to mindfully return mm -hmm. to that moment to stick with it and practice it because we can't do anything well without practicing it. So that's a great. So number one is the more that you spend your time in the present moment, the more likely you're going to have joy in, mm -hmm. in your day. Mm -hmm. So here's another one that one of my theories is that uh, uh, helping others being of service to others provides joy. That's for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's pretty universal? I think so. I hope yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and so uh, do you like help people get more of that into their life? Or do, mm -hmm. do you, do you, I would imagine as a counselor you're trying to – have them say that that's what they want to do. <laughs> sure. To. Yeah. I think you would be happier if you volunteered more at, uh, yes. at the homeless shelter. Yes. So one of the ways you can do that is say like, okay, so what's an exception of a time that you don't, you know, it's like, um, I feel like I don't have any purpose or I feel, um, really sad and down and depressed. I feel lost in the world. Oh, well, tell me a time when you don't feel that way. Tell me a time that it doesn't feel so bad. Oh, well, I guess when I'm helping out with so-and-so or when, I, when I'm over with my mom, when I'm doing something with my sister, right? And it's like, oh, okay, so there are times that you don't feel that way. Well, how can we go about doing that more, right? Mm -hmm. That's kind of how you would yeah, do it. put in more of that in your life. Right? Find those exceptions and then invite more of that into life. Mm -hmm. So um, I invite you to tell me things that you've experienced that people have told you or that you've experienced that add more joy into your life. So, for example, for me, engaging in vigorous physical activity outdoors mm -hmm. brings joy to my life. Nature is a huge one. I hear that all the time. Nature and water. Mm. Huge. Lots of people say going and walking outside, being in the woods, being in nature, swimming, being by the water, being by the lake brings mm -hmm. me joy. Yeah. Um, another would be engaging in an activity that is a bit challenging, but is within my capabilities. Mm -hmm. That um, that that kind of focuses on being here now, but it also is that sort of goal driven goal accomplishing mm -hmm. sense of fulfillment. Yeah, I hear that a lot with like physical activity and sport. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really requires that present yeah. focus. Yeah. But it could be even could like be puzzles, could be mental puzzles, yes, could right. be, yeah, lots Playing of things like and accomplishing that. Accomplishing a piece on yes. the piano or. Yeah. I also hear a lot of like art and creativity um, is wonderful for people's expression reading writing painting sculpting all kinds of stuff like that mm -hmm. and um as you are dealing with clients that are kind of looking for that sense of meaning and purpose how what are some of the tools of the trade in in helping for active reflection or contemplation i, I I think you mentioned some of them. So make note of when you don't feel sad. Make note of when you feel a sense of mm -hmm. joy. Mm -hmm. Go back to the last time that you didn't feel this way. Or was there a hobby that you loved in the past? Why did that why did we stop doing that hobby, right? Is there a way we can pick it back up, right? 
Um, was there something that made you feel connected to a loved one? Can we pick that back up? Right, Baking is a huge one. There's a lot of people who stop baking when their loved one passes and then all of a sudden they start baking again and feel really connected mm -hmm. to that loved one again. Um, knitting, sewing, crochet, there's endless possibilities. Right. Hunting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And many of those things uh, require that you be here now mm -hmm. as you're doing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, in your experience, have you had the opportunity to counsel cancer patients um, maybe on changes they want? Or, you know, one thing that comes up commonly um, for cancer patients is, is this fear of recurrence that, mm -hmm. that happens and a sense of anxiety over, I got a scan next week, and it makes you start thinking about what if, what if, what if. Mm -hmm. um, have you had the opportunity to help patients through mm -hmm. um, through those situations? Yes, definitely scan anxiety um, and just trying to stay with what is, what is, what is. And today we know that I'm okay, right, as is, right? And we, we're not going to go to that day because we're not in that day. We're going to appreciate today and try to pace ourselves and try to use our toolbox, right? Use our coping tools and our coping skills, which are, you know, sometimes distraction is a good thing, right? When distraction isn't avoidance, distraction can be a tool, right? Mm -hmm. And when we have other things that we like to do that keep us in that present moment, we can use that as a tool. When our brain is having a thought process and we can externalize it in a journal and we can write out what we're afraid of because that's really what's going on for us is that we're afraid that it's going to tell us that it's come back or that it's worsened, right? Then we can externalize that and compartmentalize that pretty safely and let that be there and let the numbers and the, and the scans tell us what they tell us. Yeah. So um, you don't ignore the fact that that that's a nope. rational thing to totally rational. I mean, you know that you're I'm having the scan because yep. we're having it to check to make sure. So if it wasn't possible it was going to return, we wouldn't have the scan. So that's, that's right. It's that's a completely rational, but, normal and valid feeling that they're yeah, having. Yep. But maybe focus on journaling a bit as opposed to just perseveration that just goes on and on. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. What's going to be helpful? Is that perseveration? Is that rumination? Is that helpful? Or is oh. that punishing? Right? Is that hurting? We don't need to hurt any more than what we're hurting. We need to be helping, right? And so if we can get it out and get it contained and have some enjoyment, then we're doing better. Um. So there's a field that is generally called positive psychology. Yes. Where you um, you don't go see someone like you, a counselor, to fix a problem, but you go to enhance a good life, to make it even better. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about what, what's your concept or understanding of positive psychology and where would someone who's on all cylinders, just like... Um, you know, I go to the dentist twice a year, not because I'm having a problem, but as part of a, a maintenance program. Mm -hmm. What is the role of a counselor to help someone with either maintenance of good health or making good mental health even better? Yes. So positive psychology is a branch of psychology that focuses on wellness and balance. And uh, despite the way that it sounds, it's not uh, the antidote to negativity, right? It, it's uh, it's not rainbows and sunshine and unicorns and just like making the negativity go away, but rather a lifting up of the positive in order to balance out the negative, right? We have an innate negativity bias that exists mm -hmm. in our brains. It's an old biological standby from our cave people days. And so we use those positivity practices to lift up the things that are positive, our gratitudes, our 
um, good practices in our wellness in order to bring balance and wholeness and mindfulness into our lives, right? And so, yeah, that it's a wellness, wholeness sort of focus. And it, yeah, I love it. <laughs> and you and you mentioned one would be gratitude. So yes, gratitude. Keeping a gratitude journal, or you yep. take so that's, that's one of the tools. What are some of the other tools in the toolbox of positive psychology? Um, so it is like naming positive things as they happen in your day, either out loud or to yourself in your mind. Right. So like, um, a person tells you know, randomly tells you that they like your shoes. Right. And instead of just like walking on in your day and like letting that just like go by the wayside, you say to yourself like, oh, that was really good. That made me feel really good. Like taking that extra 10 seconds to like lift mm -hmm. up that positive thing in your mind and then maybe later in the day lifting it up a second time and saying like that person went out of their way to make me feel good. That really felt good. Right. Mm -hmm. Um that's another thing. Um, doing things to notice, um, going around the table. Uh, one of the things that I recommend is like, um, instead of a postmortem of your day around the table of like, how was your day? Oh, it was awful. This happened. And this person complained about that thing. Um, next and, thing you know, everyone's yeah. trying to outdo uh -huh, yes, how and bad your day was. So and so is still bothering me about this, right? This is what happens, right? This is what we do. We hold on to the negative. It's what we do. But instead of that, we each have to go around and name the positive things that happened in mm -hmm. our day, mm -hmm. right? It's a way of making the positive an integrated part of mm -hmm. our life. Yeah. I, you know, as you call that, I, I, without any of the understanding of maybe the uh, theory behind it, uh, one of the, the, almost always my uh, first encounter with a patient that I've known is coming back for follow-up, whether they are coming for survivorship and they're cured of their cancer and they're living with cancer clinic where they have incurable cancer. My first question is, what has brought you the most joy uh -huh. since I last saw you? Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of the same thing you're it saying. It is, yep. So in, before we just delve into where do you hurt and how bad is it, mm -hmm. what has brought you joy? Yes. Yeah. It's why in performance reviews, we want to lead with the things that we've noticed that are positive before giving growth advice. Yes. Right. Accentuate the, the positive. Yeah. Eliminate the negative. Mm -hmm. And something about Mr. In Between somewhere. Else. That's an old <laughs> song. Um, you know, I have a feeling that we have lots of people that want to ask you some questions. Sure. So I think we're going to open it up a bit to questions and they're raising their hands already. So we have a live studio audience here and we're going to go to them first. But if you are watching us live streaming, we please invite you to uh, put a question in the uh, comments or uh, section uh, of your um, app that you're watching us on. So, Angelina. Hi. Um, I'm actually seeing a counselor. i uh, been going through the cancer, and I have major anxieties. And so I had to go through steps. And when the hardest thing is when they send you to so many different machines, MRI, I can't handle spaces so I have to sing and I forgot to tell the tech by the way I'll be singing and she's like are you okay are you in pain I'm going okay what is she saying about my singing and I said no I have this is how I do things <laughs> I'm like whoa I might have been off key and then um, my PET scan was the scariest for me for some reason and she put the pressure on saying because of my diabetic it had to be 160 and when she checked my blood, it's 210. And I went, she goes, are you a bit nervous? Or like, well, yeah, <laughs> this is my first diagnosis. And you have all these tests. And we couldn't go through the chemo until this. And she goes, well, then we'll have to reschedule. And I said, well, can, we, can we take a deep breath for a second? I said, I've been doing things on YouTube and meditation. And it was one for um, blood pressure. Mm -hmm. I said, let me try and find this music. And I'll try going down to 160 is what the doctor wanted for me to do this. If you can give me 10 minutes, we can do this. So she, she did the light. She gave me that. And she said, she was kind of watching me. She said, you were in such a deep. And I said, yeah, I brought it down. When I woke up well, from the meditation, I said, 
I think I got it at 160. And so when she tested me, her eyes went big because we were wearing a mask. And I said, did I not do it? No, you actually hit it at 160. And I said, cool, I can have the PET scan. I can't believe I was excited about that. But And she goes, yeah, but I'd like to take you to casino this weekend if you're that good, you know. And I said, you know, then I realized that was my draw to do that. And I still try to do that. I did that through chemo. And, mm -hmm. and then they played music when I did the radiation. Is there any particular kind of music that you encourage people when doing that kind of meditation and talk? Mm -hmm. I would say whatever works. works. I mean, everybody is so different, but like if you find something that feels like really that matches you and your, your particular rhythm and need, that's exactly where you should be. Right. Mm -hmm. That's so amazing to figure out that you have your hand on the dial like that. That's like, magic right yes. <laughs> that's the coolest experience so yeah just whatever works for you oh yeah. good. what yes. about uh guidance for people who have difficulty sleeping uh -huh. especially <laughs> yeah because <laughs> one, yes. of, yes. you know rumination and work <coughs> mm -hmm. excuse me yeah what, what are some um tips that you think are effective in helping yeah folks at nighttime Yes. So I promote sleep hygiene first and foremost, right? Which means we've got to turn off devices at least. I mean, I know 60 minutes is a big ask, but 60, so 30 to 60 minutes prior to bed, no blue screens, right? Read a book, do something like that before we've got to turn down the lights, get your brain prepared because what we're doing is we are keeping our brains revved up and then asking them, to turn down on a dime and they're not prepared for that, right? So sleep hygiene is a thing. We've got to take those blue screens away and prepare our brains, have a nice sleep routine that we repeat that prepares us for sleep. Now, another helpful thing that if we know that we're ruminators is to journal stream of consciousness, get those worries out and on paper, externalize them, and then leave them there. Tell them that you've thought them through <laughs> and that if there are more of them, you'll journal them tomorrow night and have them on that paper, right? So, and you don't have to keep that paper. You can shred it. You don't have to keep it, right? Um, then if you really need, sound machines are good. Um, there are certain um, meditations that can pull your um, consciousness from really far away all the way into yourself, right? So it's like, what's the furthest thing away you can hear? And then what's a little bit closer? What's in the room with you? What's in the bed with you? What can you hear? Like your crinkling of your sheets. Can you hear a sound that's just right by your ear? Now, can you hear any like gurgling in your body or your breath, that kind of thing? And usually that calms your body enough that you can kind of drop off to sleep. So there are things that you can do to help yourself sort of drop so off. So I know we're sleep. not supposed to use our phones, but what about the apps? Yep. For a little meditation. Face okay. down. Okay. Yep. I've had it off for an hour, but mm -hmm. now I, I might just face turn it down. On to audio face. books are okay. fine. Okay. There are apps that have like people reading like bedtime stories. That's fine. Uh -huh. um, and there are sleep, sleep meditations. Meditation That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Just have them screen down. It's just that blue light, right? There are switches to switch off the blue light onto like a um, orangish sort of light. That's helpful. Right. Okay. And um, if you wake up in the middle of the night, just stop trying to go back to sleep. Get up, do a crossword puzzle, read a book. Just stop trying to go back to sleep and you will fall back to sleep. <laughs> Have other questions? I have a flip side to that question. What I'm trying to get up now because mm -hmm. now I had to do early retirement and all this. And so when I get up, other than the exercise I have to do before getting up, um, I always tell myself, I am thankful, I am grateful for what the day is to come. Mm -hmm. And so I try not to set, so oh, I got to clean this, I got to do this, I got to do, I just say, if I can challenge, take it, I'll take it as that challenge and be okay with it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I set myself for disappointment. So, mm. so I've learned how to say that, con it's like a mantra mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And it gets me through the day and he'll call me from work. How are you doing? Pretty good. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I, I, you know, either playing with the cats or do, complaining about the cats or mm-hmm. one of the, but at least I'm up and moving around and then going to water aerobics, yoga, mm-hmm. just making goals that way. Yeah. So. I do the best that I can with what I have. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Other questions? Here we go. So um, when you were talking about kind of going for, how, what did you say, positive? Positive psychology. Positive psychology, yeah. yes. Um, I'm a firm believer in that. I, I started in a, with a counselor therapist many years ago, mm-hmm. and I just like to touch base a couple times a year. And then usually when something, she doesn't hear from me, it's usually something big and then something happens and then it's a matter of getting back. Um, she does offer some different workshops in the area and they're on Saturdays and things like that. Is that anything you would ever think about doing? Like, there's a huge need out in the community for it. Um, you know, maybe I'd invite you also to talk about um, mind spirit counseling, mm-hmm. your mm-hmm. organization and, and maybe as yeah. part of the answer to that, do you and or does your mind and spirit counseling center mm-hmm. offer that sort of workshops separate from one-on-one counseling? We have some groups, um, not like that, not like uh, wellness related groups. We've got spiritual guidance groups. We have a uh, survivor of uh, survivors of uh, suicide group. Um, we offer some other groups in and out throughout the year. Um, my f- focus generally uh, is around postpartum, peripartum, that kind of thing. Um, I'm open to a lot of things. Um, so we'll see. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. That's thank a you. very kind compliment. I will take that as a kind compliment. Thank you. Other questions? Here we go. Um, I got one, I guess. Um, uh, Let's say I go to you for counseling and uh, you give me advice and I do it and I come back to you and report what I did, Mm -hmm. right? And then that goes on for a few iterations. In your experience, uh, how many times do I go to see you or participate in your organization to be cured oh, of what gosh. I'm doing. There are no cures. Oh, a, yeah. I that, said the magic word. Yeah. Okay. No, you know, like, um, gosh, we, so our, so mind and spirit counseling, our tagline, I guess is what you would call it is like offering hope and healing. Right. It's like there's a difference between being cured of something and offering healing, right? Like I hope that you find some healing and some peace and some meaning from what you do in counseling with me. But as we've talked about, there will never be a time that there isn't some anxiety, that there isn't some depression, you know, that there isn't sadness or there isn't angst. Um, But I hope that when you feel like you're ready to be done with therapy, you feel like you have tools, you feel like you can manage, you feel like um, you have some confidence in your ability to manage your mental health on your own and that you know that who you can reach out to and how to reach out if you come to a place where you need help again. That would be my hope. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, when you go to the doctor and you fill out the questionnaire, mm-hmm. do you have anxiety? <laughs> of course we do. But yes. if you check that box, then they want to put you on medication. Yeah. or mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, I'll just lie and say <laughs> no. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I I want you to, when you think about that box, I want you to think about those things that I talked about earlier, those three things. Do you have anxiety that interferes with your ability to work or go to school? 
Do you have anxiety that interferes with your relationships? Do you have anxiety that interferes with your daily tasks of living, right? If the answer to one of those is yes, it's a conversation to be had, right? Therapy, medication, any any of those things, right? If those don't apply, then don't check the box. Good. Yeah. Thank you. That's some good practical guidance there. Yes. Okay. I have a question about age groups. So, because mm -hmm. you hear nowadays there's a lot of anxiety and problems with kids yeah. in school and mm -hmm. bullying and there's everything involved with that. But in your um, uh, opinion and from your experience, where do you see the most um, anxiety related type of problems and related to, to age? Yeah. Um, there was a very big boom in anxiety in kids in the fall of 2021. Um, it was like a real delayed effect, but I think it went along with that was when school really came back full time for kids. Um, and I will say I don't work with a lot of kids. I'm primarily working with adults. And I will say, I think that the pandemic was very hard on children and the elderly. I think that um, we assumed that those populations would be relatively okay. <laughs> And they were not. <laughs> and so I've seen some distress in both of those populations sort of spike over the last few years. But I think collectively there's been an uptick in anxiety in darn near everyone. And I think overall, I think that was a pretty normal response to what we've gone through. There's been a lot of stuff that we've all had to deal with. And so I don't think that's abnormal. Right. As you said, anxiety is a normal response. It's a natural response. Mm -hmm. And the, the question is, does it interfere with your life? And, and then what are the coping mechanisms? To yeah. Recognize your anxiety and, and then constructively use that to... Um, to manage. To manage. Yeah. Well, we could continue forever, but we don't <laughs> sure have forever. Yeah. So um, I just, uh, Laura, thank you so much. Laura Mead, yeah. mental health counselor and mind and spirit counseling. And uh, if anyone wanted to reach out to your organization, uh, what's the best way to find your organization? Uh, mindandspiritcenter.org. Mindandspiritcenter.org. Mm -hmm. So, Laura Mead, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. And thanks uh, to everyone who attended. If you know someone that would uh, benefit by watching or listening to this program, it will be available tomorrow on demand to be watched at any time uh, at the Above and Beyond Cancer YouTube channel or the Mercy Cancer Center website. Thanks again for joining us and please join us again next week. Thanks.